Janie. Good afternoon. I'm Teal Baker, Chief Operating Officer here at Invariant. Welcome to our 12th Dialogue for Change. Our topic features pay, the pay gap and how we can address those issues in the workforce as hiring managers and corporate leaders. It's getting worse for many women in the pandemic. According to Glassdoor research, men are 19.1% more than women when comparing workers of similar age, education, and experience. That gap falls to 4.9% after comparing workers with the same job title, employer, and location. When Glassdoor compares the unadjusted median base pay of different groups of workers to that of white male employees, Black women earn just 71 cents per dollar and Hispanic women a few cents more than that. For a woman starting a 40 year career, that gap can translate to tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. We might think of the pay gap as being an issue mainly for women working in jobs with hourly wages, but that isn't accurate. The New York Times on Monday highlighted a study showing female physicians earn up to 25% less than their male colleagues over their career. Pandemic unemployment puts women even farther behind. Research shows that when unemployed people get a job offer, they incur a 4% wage penalty. That penalty nearly doubles for those unemployed for a year or longer. This affects women and people of color the most due to higher unemployment levels. I count myself as lucky when it comes to my pay over 21 years in politics, campaigns, and advocacy. My first jobs on the Hill paid little, but I knew my male colleagues weren't making more than me. I remember two raises in that first house job. The first came after my boss noticed my restaurant uniform hanging in the back of my car as I drove him to the airport after votes. I explained that I was waiting tables on the weekends to supplement the $1,600 I took home after taxes. The second came after I quit for a private sector job but stayed on part time until they hired someone. Turns out I'd made myself fairly indispensable and accepted an offer to come back with a 20% raise. Transparency is often cited as part of the remedy to address the pay gap. The website Legistorm was founded in 2006 after I left the Hill and congressional salaries are now publicly available in a way they weren't before. My salaries on both Obama campaigns were set based on pay bans campaign leadership established. Even in March 2007, as the campaign was starting, I was paid significantly more than I'd been making and didn't have to fight for what I was worth. Campaign salaries are also publicly disclosed in FEC reports. In the private sector, I've benefited from bosses who were mentors, but also sponsors, ensuring I had an opportunity to do work, putting me in line for promotion and then giving me raises and bonuses that honestly changed my life. In reflecting on my journey, I recognize my privilege as a straight white woman without children. I know I had opportunities not available to women of color or mothers equally qualified to do the work I was doing especially in politics where who you know matters more than it should and getting that first break is a game changer. I know this issue is real, even for straight white women. One of my best friends a few years ago found out she was making six figures less with smaller startup equity than a male colleague. My commitment then is to pay forward my good fortune. But Glassdoor estimates in a worst case scenario that the pay gap won't be closed until 2070 if current trends continue. I look forward to our discussion this hour about how we as hiring managers and corporate leaders can do better in tackling pay as part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies. Katie Badaro is one of the country's leading experts on the intersection of pay equity, data analytics, and labor economics. As Cindio's Senior Vice President of Customer Experience, Katie possesses a decade of experience in compensation data, statistical analytics, and public speaking. Dr. Andrew Chamberlain is Chief Economist and Director of Product for Machine Learning at Glassdoor, the online jobs platform. He is an applied labor economist who has written widely on gender and racial pay inequity in the labor market. In appreciation of their participation, Invariant will be making contributions to their chosen charities, Just Capital and the National Women's Law Center. Katie, Andrew, to begin, I'd like to ask each of you to share a reflection on where we are at this moment. How does the pandemic change the way we should think about pay equity moving forward? Katie? Great, thanks, Teal. And thank you so much for sharing your statement. Quite powerful to hear it. 
I think the thing that's the biggest takeaway from the pandemic to share with you all is uh, the nickname that it's garnered that it's impossibly hard to say for myself personally, which is the she session, Mm. that essentially the idea that the pandemic has had a disproportionate negative impact on women, and that's played out in multiple ways. First, the industry's hardest hit um, by the closure of businesses around the nation, around the world, were the service industries, retail industries, hospitality, travel industries, which hire uh, women or employ women at a higher rate than men. So when those organizations shut down, women were losing jobs or furloughed or laid off at, at a rate that was exorbitantly high. The other component to keep in mind too is school closures, daycare center closures, caregiving support going away as uh, grandparents had to be isolated from their children, the grandchildren and their children meant that women at all income levels had a a ability to shoulder the majority of the home care and kind of caregiving responsibilities within their organization. Just to put a finer point on it, McKinsey found in a study that women or specifically mothers were three times as likely to meet the majority of demands for housework and caregiving during the pandemic as opposed to fathers. And to add to that, the World Economic Forum found that the average workday for a woman was extended by five hours, namely due to house care uh, and caregiving responsibilities. So when you think about women losing jobs and then women taking on or shouldering more responsibility, what that really means is it's having a meaningful impact on their opportunities for work, their opportunities for growth, and their opportunities for income. And so researchers, economists out of, out of the uh, Northwestern University tried to put a finer point on it by looking at what the expected impact was on the pay gap. Mm-hmm. So just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, when we talk about the pay gap, what we truly mean is the average pay for the average woman compared to the average man. Prior to the pandemic, that was captured as 83 cents on the dollar. And the researchers out of Northwestern estimate that's actually decreased now to 76 cents on the dollar and that it'll take 20 years to gain the ground back to pre-recession levels. It's really interesting. Andrew? Well, um, Katie did a great job summarizing the kind of state of affairs uh, and and the impact, the gender impact of the pandemic. Um, I, I wanted to say, Teal, also thank you for sharing your story. As a researcher who's been working at Glassdoor for years, I've heard so many individual stories like this. We get notes from people all over the world who say, I'm so thankful that I was able to um, get transparent pay information to understand that I wasn't being fairly compensated and that using information that you guys have shared and from other sources out there that I've used that to negotiate and close the gap. Um, So thank you for that. Um, What I would say is um, about the impact of the pandemic on the gender pay gap, the truth is, is we don't have the complete picture yet. So we definitely know that in terms of workforce participation, we know that the pandemic has disproportionately pushed women out of the workforce for all the reasons Katie just mentioned, um, especially in lower paying roles. Women, for a variety of reasons, have historically always borne disproportionately borne the burden of child care and elderly care. Um, And with schools closed and pandemic related illnesses and families, we know women have left the labor force at a greater pace than men. Many men have left the labor force also, but women have outpaced them for sure. So that impact is interesting and we're not going to see that today, like in the short term on the pay gap because what has happened is many, with many women opting out of the labor force, they are disappearing from the data on the gender pay gap, so to speak. And so we won't actually see the full impact, the full negative impact on gender pay gap until you, you know potentially years from now when these women have fully returned to the workforce and we see how they've been put on different paths permanently for having, had, having taken time off during the pandemic because of schools closed and elder care. Um, I will say there are a couple of reasons to be optimistic though today. Uh, So on the other hand, um, we do have an extremely tight labor market and we're seeing wages rise fast. And it's also encouraging employers to uh, hire anyone they can find. And so like we're seeing women sort of moving into roles they would not traditionally been prominent in, especially in the trades, uh, trucking and some blue collar roles. And so that offers some prospect for hope that we can break down the occupational barriers that have been the biggest cause of the gender pay gap forever. Um, And then a second uh, reason to be optimistic is flexibility in work. There's been a tectonic shift in work from home that's not going to go away when the pandemic's over. 
and inflexibility in work has been one of the dri biggest drivers of the gender pay gap. Because when you have inflexible work, it usually means women have to step, step off the career ladder if they decide to have children or have to take care of uh, family. And with more work from home options, essentially it's a default table stakes for every white collar job now. I'm actually quite optimistic that we can see um, in some professional roles, some, um, some of that gap close just by adding more flexibility permanently into jobs. Mm -hmm. And Andrews, I was doing my research and as I think about the, the pay gap, the difference between kind of the um, unadjusted and then controlled groups, right? Those numbers feel wider. And, you know, we, you know it's, you know, it's uh, you know, almost 5% when you control and comparing that to kind of 20%, like how should we be thinking about those differences and, and what's maybe real? Both matter. So the most commonly cited number uh, uh, for the pay gap is the overall or unadjusted gap. And that's just basically you take men as a group and put them in one side of the room, women as a group, put them on the other side of the room and look at the mean difference between them. And uh, there are, uh, so that's important because that tells us like the, in the long run, what are, what is the, all the contributing factors all added up that cause all the economic inequality between men and women in the workforce. It's important to keep that as a North Star metric. Um, and that has closed over time, right? Because of m women and men, uh, you know, uh, narrowing the gap in college education attainment, and move, you know, and moving into professional fields and so on. Um, however, it doesn't, that statistic doesn't answer all the questions. It doesn't really tell us how to shrink the gap. It doesn't tell us the causes. So one of the things researchers do is they try to identify, well, like what are the big factors? Like once, so let's try to do an apples to apples comparison. Like let's try to just compare men and women like in the same, same job family with the same education, uh, same years of experience, same working hours and so on and try to see what gap remains. That's what they call the adjusted gap. Mm -hmm. it's, the adjusted gap is this really narrow measure, which is just like, just taking two female electrical engineers with five years of experience went to the same school, like what's the difference in their pay? And that number tends to be smaller for sure. And, um, but it's not zero in any research I've ever seen. And so it shows that even when you make that super careful comparison, there's still a problem there, which can really be solved by employers just taking more responsibility for studying their pay equity. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, uh, just being conscious about actively making sure they're paying equals the same amount. Uh, what I will say is that the adjusted gap definitely doesn't tell you the whole picture, though, because it doesn't tell you whether there was discrimination or uh, uh, earlier on in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like if a company only hires females only for secretary roles and not for anything else, you can still pay like men and women secretaries exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But there, if there's no women engineers, it's right. going to look like you have no pay gap. But really, it, the, it's, a, it's an equity problem in your hiring process and your funnel. So you really have to look at both measures, to be fair. Yeah, and that's, that's yeah, a really, and Katie. Teal, just to add on to that, I would say too, we tend to think of the pay gap as really, it's an opportunity gap, right? Because mm -hmm. what it's really showing is that women and especially women of color. So we've been talking about the 82 cents on the dollar that, that's for women. For women of color, it drops down to closer to 67 cents on the dollar. What it's really showing is they're underrepresented in today's top paying positions. And so I 100% agree with Andrew that having a holistic workplace equity strategy means you need to be thinking about pay equity from a legal compliance standing but from a doing the right thing and embracing fairness at work, pay gap or opportunity gap really captures are women moving into leadership roles at the same rate as men or at the rate that represents your, your distribution in the workforce. Yeah, that's a good point. And Katie, you know, data is obviously having its moment kind of culturally and, and in our con national conversation, like, as you mentioned, um, you know, the pandemic effects and, you know, people leaning out or leaving the workforce completely and maybe missing you know, those crucial years when you, you know, um, demonstrate your aptitude for promotion and management and kind of you are on, on that track. Like what, what data are you maybe looking at as we come out of this or that companies should be paying attention to, to, to make sure that we're um, really self-aware in the next, you know, 24 to 36 months about, about those issues? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, at Cyndio, we work with several hundred organizations that cross industry, cross region, cross locations, and many of them are dealing with these same questions, which are, how do we make sure we create equal access to opportunities in this new kind of remote first hybrid workplace? Because it's no, it's no uh, lie that we are a kind of a tribal nature of the sense that we connect with people face to face. And you remember people you connect with in an office space, you socialize with them, you have all of the 
moments to kind of tap into that human connection. So not everybody has equal access to an office space when you go back to a hybrid um, work environment. So organizations we're dealing with is thinking through how do we make sure we grant opportunities, um, access to opportunities, opportunities to connect with leaders when you have this hybrid situation. The second piece is also around geographical location of the work. Mm. So oftentimes organizations pay based off where the work is located, but now where the work is located is oftentimes where your home is located. And many people have moved away from high cost areas to make uh, responsible choices for their family or for their home giving or what they need to do. And as Andrew mentioned, with high flexibility, they have the opportunity to do that now. But how do you represent that in your compensation strategy and not create inequities by, you know, in essentially handling compensation differently for those who make those choice versus the choice to stay in the office? And then the last piece that I'll mention is, is I, I love um, Andrew's optimistic view of, of the bright spots of the pandemic, and I wholeheartedly agree, but I agree with a kind of a, let's say an asterisk, a little bit of a warning to say, yes, absolutely, it's a seller's market right now, those who are selling their labor, they have the negotiation power. But research shows those who take uh, the negotiation power to heart and really play into it tend to be certain populations, tend mm. to be white men, right? So if we have a kind of a negotiation process that's allowing those who tend to negotiate to even further negotiate, mm-hmm. it might create more inequities for women and women of color relative to those men. And then the other piece to keep in mind is when you're hiring people, what that distribution of that hiring pool looks like relative to your established employees, that also could create further pay inequities as you're thinking of this fast growth competitive market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Andrew, that kind of leads into this conversation around uh, transparency, which is really scary, I think, for, you know, managers and and CEOs and and the C-suite when they think about their company and and opening up um, that data. You talked about it in your congressional testimony. Like what what value do you think that brings that maybe is is worth kind of being very out there with with what you're paying your employees? Well, transparency is an important uh, way to shine the light on policies or practices that don't stand up to scrutiny, frankly. And there's a cleansing effect of transparency that's well known. Uh, so it's there's plenty of research showing that when you bring transparency into public sector jobs, um, that pay tends to uh, pay inequities tend to disappear. Um, we also have research on our on our own platform, frankly. Like we've looked at research where um, we looked at men and women who were exposed to a salary calculator that we had online to tell them what they were worth as they were looking for jobs, and then we tracked them. Uh, uh, and, and months afterward to look at what they actually earned when they reported. And we saw, you know, see bumps up for sure on people who got more information. So um, I think that plays an important role, but it's important to note that transparency is not gonna solve all of the problems though. It's transparency really helps workers themselves advocate and negotiate for pay raises. Um, and I think that the practice of employers um, committing to transparency has a cleansing effect on management and HR practices. If you know that every year you're gonna do a pay equity analysis and you're gonna force yourself to either release it publicly or at least release it to your employees, it puts intense pressure on the C-suite to like make take that seriously as a business priority, not just a talking point, but like make sure that there's no crisis, make sure the problem is solved before it goes out. So that can be quite helpful. But um, I think that there's more than transparency needed. You know, I mean, I really think that um, employers are often reluctant to go out on a limb by doing something that they don't see their peers doing. So I do think that there's a role for better guidance, I guess, from the federal government about what's normal practice and what's the right way to look at your pay equity. And and also like um, the role, there there needs to be more attention paid to the top of funnel, to the hiring Mm -hmm. pipeline. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the research shows when you look at all the factors that contribute to the gender pay gap, occupational differences, just mm-hmm. the fact that men and women end up working in different parts of the economy with different pay scales, that explains like more than half of the pay gap overall in every study I've, we've, we've done and when you look at academic work. So that tells you where the big investment needs to be. It needs to be figuring out ways to break down that barrier, like why are women disproportionately uh, majoring in one college major and not the other? Why are they ending up in certain roles in companies and, and others? So I think that plays a um, it just equally as big of a, a role as transparency will. 
Yeah. And you testified to um, uh, the Financial Services Committee about these issues. And, um, you know, they're obviously looking at what Congress can do, maybe what regulators can do, kind of stick and carrot. What were, what beyond transparency, like what were your recommendations to the, to the committee about what's possible? Yeah, we, we discussed like three areas. One is areas where you give incentives to employers, mm-hmm. um, which is setting up pay transparency standards, um, and encouraging flexible work and childcare to avoid this issue of women opting out of leadership roles. Um, second are areas where you change what employees are doing, incentives to, uh, to change what uh, workers do. So this is things like prohibiting pay secrecy mm-hmm. so that workers can talk to each other openly about pay um, and investing in like better educational tools to help people understand pay implications of decisions that they make earlier in life. Um, and then the final thing is like, there's other institutions that are gonna have to change in the US to make a big dent in pay uh, equity, gender pay equity. I mean, um, universal childcare would probably go a long way toward boosting labor force participation of women. So any of these policies that like make it so that women don't have to opt out of earning as much as they can for, for childcare or elder care reasons, that helps. And then also um, anything we can do to change the way the universities work. I mean, it's abundantly clear when you look at the gender distribution in universities and different majors for a variety of reasons. Like you see uh, overwhelmingly male in certain majors and overwhelmingly female in others. And that affects the first five jobs people have when they, when they begin their careers. So I think that the changes to really eliminate the pay gap to make real long-term progress on it. They have to start before people show up on payrolls. They got to start much earlier on in the education system. Yeah, that makes sense. Katie, as we think about, you know, Congress and and the federal government, uh, you know, being massive employers just on their own. I mean, Congress, I think people are always surprised to to find out has like exempted themselves from a lot of the things that they pass for other employers and even just even, uh, you know, federal employees. But as we think about, uh, you know, the power of the the federal government of it, you know, often the the leading edge of some of these nudges and kind of, you know, uh, better corporate governance, if you will, or social responsibility on some of these issues, like what should should Congress and and like federal the federal workforce uh, be thinking about? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and I would say I just kind of want to snap snap to what Andrew said about universal child care um, first, because it, it has shown that not only will that create more opportunities uh, for women to enter the labor force, but it also creates more jobs for women who tend to take on those roles as well. So it's just a nice flywheel to think about. But then in thinking about the federal government, um, as you mentioned, they're large employers, they have employees, a lot of these uh Companies that we work with, uh, they have to deal with the federal government through FCCP regulations and federal contractor, but then yes, the government themselves don't necessarily have the same stringent requirements. We do work with a number of um, city and county governments, and it's really interesting to see what they're trying to do at the local level. And as we know, there's the federal level that oftentimes moves at a different pace than the local level. And so we've really leaned into working with these local and county governments to have them embrace pay equity and workplace equity as a strategy they need to do for themselves Mm -hmm. and for their own workforce. And I agree that um, our perception is transparency. Shining a light on something inherently makes people talk about it. And as they talk about it, it's going to drive towards solutions. Mm -hmm. It's not the be all end all, but it, it, it guides people on the right path. And so just to use as a quick example on that is uh, we work with a lot of organizations who have populations in Colorado. For those who don't know, the Colorado Equal Pay for Equal Work Act, part of that uh, legislation was to report pay bans Mm. or pay ranges on all postings. And because many of the organizations have populations in Colorado, they started to grip with the question of if we have to release it for our Colorado jobs, should we just release it on all of our jobs, Mm -hmm. right? We're a national organization. And so it's been really fascinating to see that um, organizations respond to local legislature at the national level Mm -hmm. to really embrace a broader transparency. That's fair. And Katie, as we think about, um, you know, the the benefits to workplaces and and corporations of having pay equity, which I think we all would agree the the benefits are are there, certainly as part of larger DEI strategies, what are the the common barriers that are maybe, uh, you know, between companies making these shifts, you know, in instances where they're not maybe kind of prodded by, um, you know, local or government forces? 
Yeah, it's a great question. There's a couple of them. I, I would say that the primary challenge is the mindset that organizations are coming into their pay equity strategies with. So if you are coming into it with a compliance, check the box, once the year type of mindset, mm-hmm. you're you're less likely to uh, adopt a holistic DEI strategy that has lasting impact. If you instead are coming to it with the mindset of, I want to get ahead of this, I want to be proactive, I want to plan, I want to think about this in an ongoing way. What we've seen with organizations who do that is they tend to have a lower remediation costs for pay inequities that do come up, more meaningful distribution in their higher levels of leadership. And then when you have a more diverse leadership team, that inherently leads to all the benefits that you called out that research supports, more innovation, higher productivity. And then because we're a capitalistic society, you should just call out more money for the businesses because truly that's what they care about. So it's important to really have that mindset, that appropriate mindset to embrace pay equity in an ongoing way. The other hurdle, though, I will say is pay equity is inherently a statistical analysis. Mm -hmm. And so because it's a statistical analysis, it requires data, requires robust data, requires clean data. That can be a challenge for organizations as well as they're thinking through, well, what do we really pay for and how do we capture that and how do we represent that in data that we can utilize within an analysis? Yeah. And Katie, what's, uh, can you talk to us maybe about Sendio and its platform and and how companies are using that as a tool to uh, get at some of these questions? Yeah. So, so Sendio is a pay equity software company. So we have a platform that allows organizations to analyze pay equity standings, resolve any inequities that are called out. Um, as well as monitor it over time. And as Andrew had mentioned earlier, in this tight talent market, there's a lot of people negotiating for pay. There's a lot of starting pay happening. And that's an area we found with our organizations tends to be a big cause of pay inequities within their workforce. So we do also power starting pay decisions from recruiting teams and hiring managers to think about how do I not create a problem um, just by hiring someone? How do I ensure that I hire someone that's both competitive, but also fair relative to my incumbent work? workforce. And then the last piece that Cindio offers is to think through the opportunity gap. What does my representation look like and what should it look like? And if I don't look like how I should, how do I get there? Mm-hmm. And Andrew, you had previewed this a, a little bit in terms of how candidates are maybe using the, the data on your, your platform. Can you talk more about that? And you know, if I am a candidate out there and looking at, at Glassdoor, like what should I really be be looking at and, and thinking about how that um, hopefully you know affects my confidence in, in negotiating uh, a starting offer. Well, uh, so you of course like coming armed with facts, even if they're not perfect, puts you in a really different bargaining position than just having an opinion about what you should earn. And so I think that's one of the biggest changes that's happened in the labor market in the past two decades. Is like there was essentially no information out there except for some public sector jobs. 20 years ago. And today, especially for younger generations of workers, is becoming kind of a default stance. Like, of course, you're going to look online and sort of get a sense of what a job earns or not and use that as the as the benchmark. Um, so that's one of the most important ways in which a online platform like Glassdoor has gotten involved. I mean, like our business began 12 years ago as a platform for people to anonymously share salaries and reviews. And through that, like we, we now surface up in like the top page of Google search results for all kinds of things like that. So essentially the, all the, the pipeline of new candidates showing up at your door as an employer, they have all seen mm-hmm. Glassdoor or, or something like it before they show up. And, and people always have like a ballpark idea of what comp is. Mm-hmm. So I think that's quite powerful. Um, uh, what I will say is that uh, uh, the... Um, the, the, the difficulty that employers face, though, uh, is, is something Katie mentioned, which I, which I think is really important to call out, is that many employers, especially in their people functions, they do not feel like they have the technical expertise mm-hmm. to really like competently deal with this complex issue of pay equity. It has legal implications. It's a statistical analysis issue. They might not have a data scientist on staff, especially for medium-sized companies. And this is one of the areas where I feel like a solution like Cindio can be so powerful because it's basically an out of the box expertise like coded up for you in many ways. And like years ago, when I first started doing research on pay equity at Glassdoor, I started getting inbound requests from employers, people asking me to 
to help them out because they had seen my research and they said, well, maybe you can just take a look at our payroll data and tell us whether we have a problem. And so we actually launched a pilot and several tech companies took us up on it. And they literally turned over anonymized pay data to me and my team. And we returned back a kind of hand curated pay equity analysis. Mm -hmm. There's no way they would have been able to do that on their own. Right. You know? So I, I feel like that's, um, that's one of the most important things for people, analytics folks to, to recognize is that there are now are solutions out there that you can buy that can, that don't require you to have a data scientist or a PhD economist on your team to get good answers here. Like you can be competent and do a pretty good job with your pay equity analysis, good enough to share it publicly using the tools that are out there, things like Cindio. So I'm, that's like, one of the things that makes me really optimistic is I feel like if we can get more employers doing that, you can kind of build in solutions right into the DNA of companies. And we won't have to have, keep having these conversations about pay equity internally and like whether new hires are throwing off your pay equity stats because mm -hmm. they're, they're men and women are bargaining differently. Like if you just have a solution in place that kind of keeps you on the rails, I think all employers really, like most employers have good intentions and they want to do the right thing. It's just that they just don't have the technical capability or know how to do it. No, I think that's right. And to that point, would you talk about the toolkit that you've got on your website that, you know, is a free resource that to your point, people without, uh, you know, the ability to, to hire someone or the, um, uh, you know, mathematical expertise to, to understand what they're doing? Yes, of course. So Glassdoor is a place where people come and anonymously share their salary and they do so like while they're on the site looking for jobs. So we've collected tens of millions of salary reports that way. And we basically make it all freely available more or less. Um, we do have really sophisticated machine learning behind the scenes that helps people like have an advisor on their shoulder, sort of showing them what pay ranges are likely or possible for different jobs. Um, and so basically that's the consumer product that we have is mm -hmm. people come to Glassdoor and can just kind of like freely search, look at pay for different companies, for different roles in different locations. And then at the same time, while they're there, like if they see something that looks interesting can go also apply to jobs. That's basically how our platform works. Mm -hmm. And, but you had talked too about, um, uh, and I think it was like maybe 12 steps. Like there was, a, I was on your website and there was a PDF, like as an employer, like if you've, to Katie's point, if you've got kind of the clean data and kind of can organize it in a way, you know, some, find some of the person who knows Excel best in your organization and, and go at it. Um, what's that approach from, from the employer side? Yes, we do have a guide for employers. It's like a cookbook that I put together and it has some sample data and some sample code that any, any like data analyst could use. What I was trying to do in that guide was to take the same methodology that labor economists and academia use when they get called in to do like a really deep dive on pay equity and just code it up and like give it away so that people could simply implement it themselves. And so what, what the guide does is sort of walks you through how to technically do a pay equity analysis the same way an academic researcher would do. Um, and it also coaches you on like when you're ready or not to do it. Mm -hmm. Because as Katie mentioned, you, it, you gotta have the data in shape. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just, you know, like if you don't have HR tech systems in place with quality, like updated data, um, you know, you're not really going to be able to do this if you're not tracking like how long people have been in the roles and what their latest performance evaluation was and right. uh, like uh, figuring out the total compensation package, not just base mm -hmm. pay, but like mm -hmm. bonuses and commissions and stock options and other things. You really need to look at the complete picture. So the guide is designed to like tell you when you're ready to do so. And then once you're ready to like, just know how to talk intelligently about it, know the difference between the unadjusted and raw gap and the adjusted gap know that they are both important for different reasons, how to get from one to the other, and just to like demystify the math behind it. Yeah, that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Katie, another um, piece of this conversation that, that happens that isn't so much um, the pay gap necessarily in terms of you know, people doing the same role or on, on gendered lines is the difference between you know, what CEOs are making to kind of their you know, frontline or, or um, you know, average employee. Like what are, what are the ways, and this comes from the audience, what are, what are ways to maybe think about that? Are there metrics? Like, is there you know, some perfect ratio that we should all be aiming towards? Like what's, what, what, what are you thinking on, on that particular topic? Yeah, that's um, the CEO to average worker pay ratio is um, continually widening, mm -hmm. right? It's It's been getting wider and wider and larger and larger um, over time. And in fact, almost on an exponential scale. 
And I, I think really what that does is it, it, it demotivates people, honestly, is what it is, is you, you, if you feel you are so meaningfully um, undervalued relative to the top leadership, it's really hard for employees to feel engaged and like they're, they're working towards a common problem uh, within the organization. So I, I couldn't say off the top of my head a magic ratio that would make sense for businesses. It makes sense for the economy. Yeah. But I would say thinking about how uh, that should be, you know, we should shrink it to, in order to keep our employees engaged and, and seen as part of the crew that's leading that business to success is, is an important conversation for organizations to in, internally focus um, on themselves to think about. Yeah. And this um, question is uh, kind of a toss up or, or to both of you, just beyond, you know, um, pay issues. Andrew, I know you have data on Glassdoor too, just about employee satisfaction with, um, especially for um, you know, employees of, of color with companies, DEI initiatives, and what's actually happening in the workspace beyond pay. How do all those things, um, you know, work together to, uh, you know, engagement and, and satisfaction on an employee level? Well, um, pay is only one element, obviously, of the total compensation package. And there's all sorts of career advancement issues, whether you feel like you have a path forward or not. Um, uh, whether you see people like you represented in the senior leadership suite. Um, there's the benefits package about whether employers are, you know, offering up the benefits that you need in order to kind of clear the way in your life for you to focus on your career, including things like childcare and so on. Um, uh, so I, I think that definitely there's a more complicated picture there than just pay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think that, um, I think that uh, the, ben the benefits offerings are one important way that companies can try to attract more talent and break down these uh, gender barriers in different roles. It's just trying to, um, trying to identify the reasons why they aren't seeing the candidate pools that they want for certain roles and try to figure out what can they offer up to solve those problems. I think many companies might be surprised that it's not as hard to shake the bushes and find uh, many more candidates than they are getting now. Mm -hmm. If they're more transparent about what the benefits are and what the workplace culture is that they're offering. Like transparency is interesting and in that it can change, it can change behavior on both sides. Like if, uh, just by the, like if employers are more transparent about what's being offered up and what the comp is, they can change the mix of the candidate pool completely mm -hmm. by pulling people over to, to, to take an interest in roles at their company versus their competitor. Um, so it's not just a matter of like for existing employees, them knowing what they're worth and negotiating. It's like you changes the next generation of employees by attracting different uh, pools. Yeah. Yeah. So, so much of it is, you know, what you, maybe see, you know, your, your family do or jobs that, you know, exist, but, and, you know, things are obviously easier now with kind of the internet and, and the information um, that's available. But, you know, thinking like, as I was growing up, like you didn't know that people had certain jobs, that that was a thing you could do, or that you would have access to that or, um, you know, uh, various issues um, like that. So I think just, um, just more information in general, I, I think helps. Katie, any, any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I'd like to add, um, I, Absolutely. It's more than about just pay. But one thing that I will say specifically about pay is that um, pay equity in and of itself is an important lever for your employer brand. Mm -hmm. So we talk to organizations about this. There's there's not too many organizations talking about pay equity. It's mm -hmm. it's like less than 100 mm -hmm. um, of, you know, Fortune 500 companies who are out there sharing the information. But what's been shown actually by um, Just Capital is that those who talk about it are, are seeing higher financial returns mm -hmm. than those who mm -hmm. aren't for, you know, a plenit plenitude of reasons. But one of the other pieces that I would mention too is um, the working population now is majority millennial mm -hmm. and they are very hungry for transparency. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they, and they also are hungry for socially just issues. And so pay equity fits very squarely and talking about pay equity fits very squarely into that. 
And there's research that um, previously at my prior organization I had overseen that was really tying um, different factors to employee engagement and retention of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And one of the findings that we saw is that having a fair and transparent pay process actually mattered more than pay relative to market for sure. both of those, for sure. both in, uh, engagement and retention. So mm -hmm. the takeaway is it's not necessarily what you pay, but why mm -hmm. you pay, what you pay that matters for you know keeping your employees happy and keeping them with you. We've talked a lot about hiring and what we need to think about that top of the funnel. But the important thing to keep in mind is if you put a lot of effort into hiring women or um, people of color and then don't put an effort into retaining them, it's just going to be this constant leaky valve. So thinking about strategies to do that is really important. Yeah, no, loyalty definitely goes both ways um, for sure. And not to put you on the spot, Katie, are there um, companies maybe that you would say are doing this well to your point that, you know, folks are, are interested, like how should we be talking about this publicly or, or in the market that kind of to look at some of, the, some of that leadership? Yeah, great question. I mean, one, I think one of the premier bands uh, doing pay equity well, one of our customers actually is Salesforce. Hmm. Mark Benioff is very uh, public about his stance on pay equity and the importance of pay equity and how it needs to be an executive leadership uh, issue. They regularly share their results. They talk about their methodology. They go in depth about what they found and, and um, what their takeaways were. Mm -hmm. And then the other uh, piece that I would mention is there's a nonprofit called the Fair Pay Workplace. Hmm. And the Fair Pay Workplace is a, a third party certification certification company that essentially has a consortium of experts from the legal fields, HR fields, data science fields, economics fields, who have gotten together and say, hey, this is the right way to run a pay equity analysis. These are what the rules and standards should look like. So organizations can sign up to have their methodologies tested against mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. rules and standards and essentially get certified and a stamp of approval from the Fair Pay Workplace. Um, some of the organizations that they recently certified that have seen a boost in um, response from their employees for for their certification is like American Airlines, um, mm -hmm. University of California, Irvine, and also Anthem Healthcare. Got it. And Andrew, it was and I mean, not surprisingly on, on your website to see that you've turned the lens on yourself as an employer. Any uh, lessons that came out of that maybe after the first time and, and adjustments that um, you maybe continue to, to make to make sure you're walking the walk, as they say? Yes. Uh, after I published my first study uh, using Glassdoor data to show pay equity in the U.S. and around the world, we uh, the executive team came to me and they said, maybe we should be doing this <laughs> ourselves and taking our own medicine. So that's the year that we launched our own annual process. We still do it today. Mm -hmm. We... Um, you, you know, we, we study pay equity both uh, by uh, age, gender, race, ethnicity, and then we share the results internally, um, share uh, as much as we can publicly while protecting privacy mm -hmm. in a blog post. So it goes out to the world. And um, it's uh, quite interesting. I mean, it's, uh, it's really like made it a business priority. And so it's built into the regular comp adjustment cycle. And so it's really, it's, so there's no more surprises anymore. <laughs> like there's, it's always like when, it, when comp adjustment time comes, like we're already looking at equity pro proactively. And then we do get some employer branding benefits from it by sharing it publicly, as Katie mentioned. This is one of the biggest motivations, I think, for companies getting ahead of this, these issues and like studying it and being open about it and sharing it with the world is they get powerful PR and talent right. attraction benefits. Um, that they just might not be thinking about. I think a lot of companies are really sort of risk averse. They're just yep. afraid of sharing this. They're not sure what's going to happen if they open up that Pandora's box. But our experience has been, it's been extremely positive mm -hmm. and employees love it that we do it every year. Yeah. And, um, and we have definitely caught problems before they went into effect. Like we have made comp changes actively because we've identified gaps in that process. And it's just made it like much more, routine, you know, yeah, and we're just constantly right. scanning for it and we go out with it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been generally very positive and, uh, um, I'm kind of surprised, honestly, that I don't see more employers getting ahead of it, doing that. It's such a simple, simple thing to do. And it just show your cards to people. What do you yeah. have to hide? You know, I just think it's, fear of the unknown it's fear no, that they don't have yeah. the expertise to do it is why more people don't i think that's right like deciding to to walk off the cliff like is super scary but you also like end all that internal angsty stuff right about what are we doing and should we be talking about this and are we doing the right thing and like just uh, making the decision and, and moving forward and and to both of your points like seeing the the benefits hopefully roll back um from that both 
um, you know, in um, market and profit, but also just in employee re retention and, um, and satisfaction on that. So um, just as we um, think about wrapping up here, um, Katie, we'll, we'll start with you. What's the, the most meaningful action that employers should be uh, taking right now to, to advance on these issues? Oh, well, absolutely. I believe it's a proactive review of their pay equity. <laughs> I mean, I think exactly as Andrew mentioned, just because you don't look doesn't mean there isn't something to find. Mm -hmm. And so organizations are scared, but it, it's actually more scary to be forced into that situation, right? To, to be on the defense, um, defensive end versus the offensive end. Uh, and the other component I would say is to really take a broader view of their workplace equity strategy, which is to think about it, pay equity is a very meaningful piece that they absolutely should be adjusting and thinking about. But what about their representation within their hiring pool, within their workforce, within their leadership positions? How do we make sure they're making lasting, meaningful change that all together will further um, drive up the pay gap or drive it closer to dollar for dollar? Andrew. Well, I also agree every company should be doing a, at least an annual pay equity analysis. I mean, it's not that difficult to do and it uh, is just a very good internal discipline. Um, and even if you don't feel comfortable making it public, you should at least be sharing it internally with employees so that people mm -hmm. see that mm -hmm. you're actually taking action on this and it's mm -hmm. not just talking mm -hmm. points. And I think doing so builds it right into the DNA of a company that, that, that we will never ever have a large pay equity problem if each year we try to reset mm -hmm. and get it back to zero. Mm -hmm. um, second thing is, I think um, every company needs to like find their own narrative about why do pay equity. Mm -hmm. I think that every company has, each company has different ways of like building conviction around things that they invest in. At Glassdoor, what I found is that um, we, you know, we found like innovative benefits of having more diverse teams. And that's one of the most powerful reasons why we invest in our DEI culture here is that we see the like nuts and bolts business benefits of having the diverse leadership team along gender and, and race ethnicity lines. And it bears it out in our performance. And it's like, that's just the one example of a way that every company needs to kind of like figure out the story they tell themselves about why this is so important. And it won't be the same for every company. Some people will be more concerned about the external benefits of talent attraction. Some people will be more concerned about retaining talent. Some people will be more concerned about risk management, legal issues, compliance. And some people will be concerned about like business benefits. So I just think figure, figure out what your story is and, and that will help build the muscle for executives like keeping this going year after year. Um, and then like the last thing I think that every company should be doing is looking at their senior leadership and their board of directors mm -hmm. and making sure that they've set up examples of what they want the rest of the workforce to look like, because it's going to be a powerful signal to candidates when they come in and see that these people have won the tournament and they look just like me. And if you don't have that, like, don't be surprised if candidates from unusual backgrounds who are underrepresented, like say no to you and say yes to someone else. I just think that that's important. It's not enough to just look at the numbers. You have to look at who's in the seats also. Right. I mean, everybody wants to, to see a path for themselves, I think, right, as, as they think about um, work and, and purpose. So, well, we've come to the end of our 12th uh, Dialogue for Change. Really appreciate everybody joining us. And certainly thank you to uh, Katie Badero and Andrew uh, Chamberlain for joining us. Uh, this afternoon. Please look for emails from Invariant for more details about the Dialogue for Change. There was also a question um, in the chat about um, the recording and whether it would be shared, and the answer is yes. So look for an email with kind of our wrap-up and key takeaways from today's conversation and also a, a link to the, to the whole thing, um, and also additional resources just as we think about DEI um, strategies in general. Uh, you can find Invariant at, at, uh, on Twitter, at Invariant, um, and also on LinkedIn. And to learn more about Cindio's resources, you can visit, um, it's syndo.io uh, forward slash demo, and that will be in our um, wrap up email um, as well. So thank you uh, both for joining us and, and thanks again to everybody for listening in.